inhibit is that the laser cooling essentials are the same, more or less, for the ions and for the nucleus. Um, the neutrals are uh, cooled in ensembles, so typically we end up with like 10 to the 6 cold atoms. Um, and they're much colder. They're, they're at nanokelvins of temperature after laser cooling and evaporated cooling. So we can really treat them as zero temperature reservoir with respect to the, the ion. And now we're combining these two systems together. These are the best controlled quantum systems, um, for sure, in the, in the atomic physics uh, community, but probably uh, throughout all the systems, I, I would say, um, as the case. And uh, our, when we started to do these experiments, of course, there was the, the big question out there, um, what do we actually have uh, as, an, as an added value by combining two, two of such uh, high control quantum systems together. And um, so here are the things that we came up with in the beginning that we wanted to study, it was five or eight years ago. Um, so the obvious thing is, of course, ultra cold collisions and chemistry. Um, and this is also what turned out to be the most fruitful and then the most, uh, uh, the broadest topic that we could address with these systems. Because this now all of a sudden gets you into regimes of chemistry that people have never explored before. So this is chemistry at temperatures well below Kelvin, but still in the gas phase where, where particles can collide with each other, they undergo chemical reactions. And you can really watch these reactions at the level of single atoms. And uh, this is most of the, the lecture uh, today. And um, so this, I think, is a nice example for where combining two very consistent together really gives you an added value uh, in, a, in a way that there's not a new technology coming out of this, as, as was mentioned in previous talks, but this really gives you access to, to regimes of physics or chemistry which wouldn't be explored. The other thing is, of course, quantum information processing and, and the studies of decoherence quantum systems. We also do that um, where we look at how the spins of these uh, nuclear spins or the electron spins um, of the atoms of the ions behave when they're when they're touching the earth. So you can basically think of this as a single ion embedded in some kind of bath of spins, and you can investigate how a single spin compared to the ion decoheres up onto this interaction. And then there's also the, the, the opposite view of that is how does an impurity like the single ion affect the many body quantum state of the many atoms. So we, don't, we have not done experiments really uh, in this realm so much, so maybe may I will focus on the first two things and what has been seen and what has been understood there. So here is the outline. Uh, we'll first give you a brief introduction of how to merge both Einstein condensates and, and single ions experimentally, what the challenges are and how the apparatus looks like. Um, then I will talk to, you, talk to you about the elastic collisions between the atoms and the ions. Um, so basically just collisions where momentum is exchanged um, between ions and atoms and, and what is interesting and, and what we can learn there. And then the big part will be on chemistry, so where really the, the properties of the particles change. So you have charge exchange collisions, for example, you spin exchange collisions, and so on. Okay, so let's start out with the, the neutral atoms. Um, neutral atoms are just like the ions prepared in an ultra high vacuum chamber by means of laser manipulation. You basically, you start out with a, with a vapor of, say, rubidium gas um, in an ultra vacuum chamber. You shine on the light onto these atoms to cool them down in a so called magneto optical trap, which forms a relatively dense cloud of atoms, maybe 10 to the 9 atoms at 100 microkelvins or so temperature. Um, and, uh, however, the laser cooling prohibits you really from reaching nanokelvins of temperature because this is way below the temperature of the recoiling photon. <coughs> the minimum temperature you can cool to with laser cooling is the temperature which is limited by a single photon recoil of the atom because you're continuously scattering photons on the atom. So in order to go below these temperatures, um, you have to confine the atoms differently and cool them differently. And this is done by transferring them into a so-called magnetic trap, which is an inhomogeneous magnetic field produced by, for example, three coils here. And um, in this inhomogeneous magnetic field, the atoms are trapped by the interaction of their magnetic moment with the external field. So we create an absolute field minimum at the center, and then the particles where, which, which lower their energy with decreasing fields, so called low field seeking states, they are attracted to this magnetic field minimum at the center, and they're confined here. 
cooling in this magnetic trap then proceeds very much in the same way as, as cooling down your, your cups of coffee. You simply evaporate atoms out of this trap. You boil them all. Uh, and you force this a little bit by shining on some radio frequency where you selectively spin flip atoms which are on the outer surface um, of the cloud, so atoms which have the most energy. And uh, you selectively remove those from the trap and then the remaining ones get thermalized and go to low temperature. And after a while, the atoms reach maybe 100 nanocarbons or so in the center of the trap, and they form a bosine stand condensate. So a collective uh, quantum state where all the, the 10 to the 6 atoms are described by one quantum mechanical point. That's the setup. Uh, just to give an idea, the spacing between the coins here typically is on the order of 3 centimeters. So now, in order to combine this with the, with the ion trapping, um, we built the magnetic trap, as shown here in this, in this orange color, and then we sandwiched the ion trap that I showed you yesterday, right in the middle of, between the coil, just where the coil atoms are prepared. Essentially. On top of that, we also have some LED beams going in here, which form optical dipole traps, which are spin insensitive traps, as opposed to the magnetic traps, which are helpful for some of the chemistry experiments. And the experimental sequence basically is we start to prepare the cold neutral gas <coughs> roughly here. Uh, roughly a centimeter away from the position of the ion. Um, through all the cooling procedure, it takes about a minute to produce this cold gas, whereas the ion is there all the time. Um, cool this down, and then when it's cold, we just transfer it into the into the ion trap region. So here's a zoom in. You see that this end cap electron is actually hollow, which has a 200 or 300 micron core, and through this, we shift then the ions into the interaction region, and the atoms into the interaction region with the ion, and then overlap them. Here's basically the cartoon. I showed you this picture yesterday. Here's our fake ion crystal um, in there. And then the neutral atoms come in from the side, um, over, being overlapped with, the, with one or two ions at the center, and then interacting with them there. And then we can study the, the physics of this hybrid system. OK, so the, the choice for our experiment um, was to use a combination of neutral rubidium atoms and the single charge terbium ions. The terbium level structure you've seen yesterday already. So again, it's an alkali-like structure in S1 half brown state, which may or may not have a, a hyperfine splitting depending on which isotope uh, one is using. Then a very strong optical transition to the P1 half state. Here's the D state. And over there is an F state. I didn't show you this yesterday, but today we're going to use that state. Um, as well. I've also given you here the line widths of these transitions, which is the inverse of the excited state lifetime. So this is a very strong transition, 20 megahertz line width, so I think 8 nanoseconds is the lifetime of the excited state. The, um, the B state here um, has 50 milliseconds lifetime. So this is uh, metastable, of course. I mean, by, by normal standards, 50 milliseconds is a short time. But uh, for the experiment we're doing here, 50 milliseconds is exceedingly long because 50 milliseconds is much longer than the collision rate between the atoms. <laughs> so we can really prepare the atoms in that E state and wait for the collisions to occur. And we can really say, OK, these particles <coughs> are colliding in the D state. This is very different to many experiments of, um, of cold collisions in excited states that have been done before, for example, with neutral atoms, which were always in the presence of laser light. So you, you can do collisions, for example, with two particles in the P1 half state, but it's never a metastable configuration because they, they decay in 8 nanoseconds. You always have to pump in light to maintain the atoms up in this state when you want to study the collisions in that state. This is different for the D state. The F state has a lifetime of 10 years. And so um, <coughs> when the ions pump into that state, it's really dark and it stays there longer than the duration of PhD. And uh, how do you know that the lifetime is that long? Sorry? How do you know that the lifetime is that long? Um, because they were scared stupid. <laughs> <laughs> uh, congratulations. Congratulations. Um, so I think that the best that people have seen, so people do use this transition here, which is an octopole transition. This is highly forbidden uh, as an electrical tra uh, transition. Um, and people use this for atomic clocks. And I think the best that they've seen on this transition is millihertz. Uh, line width, which is still limited by the lasers that you use to probe the transition. So never, never, no one has seen the 10 to minus 8 hertz um, on, that, uh, on that transition. But it's very actively studied for, uh, for atomic clocks. For us, it's a bit of an, it's a bit annoying because 
if the atom is, if the donation ends up over here, and you see that this is in principle possible because there is a decay channel P to D, D to F, um, the, we have really have to, to work hard to get it back into the states where we can see them, which is basically S and P. Right? And for this we have to shine a more laser light to pump it up to this weird state. From here it can decay here, then we pump it further to this, and then it decays down here again. So we don't want to wait for 10 years before we uh, proceed with the experiment. Okay, so what are the basic um, interactions between atoms and ions? Um, so, so, very first approximation, we can think of the ion as something which is neutral but polarizable, and the uh, sorry, the atom is something that's neutral but polarizable, and the ion is a charge. So, when we put a charge into a polarizable medium, then uh, we can think of the medium as consisting of little dipoles. These dipoles orient themselves towards the charge. So these dipoles are induced by the charge and then they orient themselves to the charge. So the electrostatic energy is dipole moment times electric field. Since the dipole moment is induced, the whole thing goes like polarizability times electric field squared. So we get an interaction which is minus the electric field strength squared. And um, what you see from this immediately is that this interaction does not depend on the sign of the charge. So this is, this is uh, maybe at first surprising, but um, this is really what, what comes out here. Um, it, it doesn't really matter whether these experiments with positively or negatively charged particles, the interaction potential between the ion and the neutral at this level of approximation would be the same. Okay, so we know the electric field of the ion, just cool on, uh, 1 over r squared, and uh, so asymptotically for large distances, the interaction potential between ion and atoms goes like 1 over r to the 4. So this is very different from the standard van der Waals interaction between pairs of neutral atoms, which goes like 1 over r to the 6. This is much more long range here, uh, but it's also more short range, say, for example, than a dipole dipole interaction, which would be 1 over r cubed. So we're somewhere in the middle. At short distances, um, we get the normal molecular physics uh, at, at work. So when, when the ion and the atom they come too close to each other, we just get the Coulomb repulsion of the nuclei eventually. So we get a hardcore repulsion at very short distances, and then some interpolation of the potentials in the two. So this is, this is roughly the interaction that we can expect. As a logic, it's, it's very well known. It only depends on the polarizability of the neutral atoms, which is very well known. Okay. So now, um, so what is the depth of this potential? Okay. Um, it's, just, it's more or less the same as an atom. It's the ego, the EB. Okay. I mean, this is the this is basically the, the bound state in our case of the R B Y B plus molecule, um, okay. right? And this is this is this is again EB. Okay. So where has this been uh, looked at? And maybe one of the the nicest illustrations of uh, neutral charge particle interaction is uh, in superfluid helium. So these are pictures from the late 70s where people were looking for uh, vortex lattices in superfluid helium. And what they were doing basically is they were setting the superfluid helium into rotation. Then quantized vortex lattices appeared in the helium. And then the question was how do you actually see that? And what they did is they just immersed electrons into the helium. And the electrons went to the regions where the density was the lowest. And these were the, the vortex core lines. And uh, then they extracted the electrons on uh, PMT, or, 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 or uh, the yeah, uh, charge-sensitive uh, display, and uh, they could really see then this, the structure of these vortex, or these vortex lattices appear um, where the electrons were trapped inside the helium. And this is more or less it's the same interaction as a charged particle with something that's polarizable, and uh, here this was actually used to illustrate these, uh, the, the quantization of the, um, of the angular momentum in rotating buckets of superfluid helium. In our experiments, we look more at the single atom, single ion physics, but uh, this, these were very interesting experiments. <coughs> okay, so now um, we go ahead, we immerse our ion into the both ions and condensate. Um, and basically we take an experimentalist approach, we just do it and see what's going to happen. 
So, um, as I explained yesterday, the ion is in an harmonic trap. It's, uh, it's a relatively loose trap for ion trapping standards, so we made this deliberately relatively weak uh, to match the energy scales a little bit. Um, so the level spacing in this harmonic trap uh, in, 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 in Kelvin's is two micro -kelvins. This is still bigger than the chemical potential or than the, than the temperature of the most Einstein condensate, but it's not all the same. So the, the, the initial atoms, they are in this, in this trap, uh, which has a trap of one micro Kelvin, and the Einstein condensate has a temperature of on the order of 100 Kelvin. So why did we choose these parameters? Um, well, we chose these parameters because we wanted to see the interaction between the ion and uh, neutral atoms. And what you can see here in this arrangement basically is when you prepare the ion in a, in a certain vibrational state, not the ground state, but some excited state, and the, the atom and the ion are colliding with each other, this can promote the ion to different vibrational states um, in the harmonic oscillator, just by the interaction. And um, if the ion changes its vibrational quantum, so it, then, then this amount of energy basically is released, this has to be taken up by the atom, and but there's enough in energy for the atoms to get lost from this trap. So basically the first indication of this interaction between the ions and the atoms is just the signal of a trap loss of atoms from the Bose-Einstein condensate, namely just from the, the energy which is taken out from the harmonic oscillator of the ion. And here's basically as a function of time how the atom number decays, and from this you can then derive uh, the collisional cross-section uh, between the atoms and the ions. Very, very simple. Now, when atoms get lost here, this means we dump energy into the Bose-Einstein condensate. And since overall energy is conserved, this at the same time must mean that the ion has been cooled in that process. So the ion is uh, de-excited from high vibration states down to lower uh, vibration state at the same time where we lose the atoms from the gas. And this is something we wanted to see, whether we can indeed use the, the ultra-cold atoms um, to cool down um, the ion. Now the question is, uh, can we somehow independently measure the temperature of a single particle? And you, this is usually a point of a, of a debate, um, namely what is actually temperature, what does temperature mean when you talk about a single particle? Um, so strictly speaking, we can only talk about expectation uh, values or average values of energy. Um, and when I say temperature here, I think about this as an ensemble average. So I think about thousands of realizations of the same system, look at the, the energy in every single realization, look at the um, variation of the energy, and then this could be thermal uh, or could not be thermal, uh, but uh, I can assign this, this uh, energy uh, fluctuation or energy variation. So we put the ion in the, in the trap. It had some energy state. Um, and now we illuminate this um, with a laser beam. And we look at the amount of photons that this atom scatters. So when the atom is highly excited, sorry, when the ion is highly excited, um, there is a huge Doppler shift and, uh, from just from the motion of the ion, and the, the fluorescence rate will be low. So this is basically, again, the same expression yesterday, the scattering rate of uh, a single particle, a single two-level system, basically, from a laser, depends on the detuning. The detuning is velocity-dependent due to the Doppler shift, and so uh, we can measure, essentially, the average velocity by light scattering. However, as explained yesterday, when we do that, at the same time, we cool the ion, so after a while of uh, illumination, the ion will be down maybe to the ground state or maybe take to some lower uh, vibration state in the ion trap. And uh, so we have to time resolve this measurement, basically, and uh, look at the initial point of the fluorescence. So what we see here, basically, as a function of time, we see the fluorescence rate from a single ion, and uh, so this is average over tens of thousands of repetitions of the experiment. And you see that the, the average of the fluorescence increases to some saturation value. So this saturation value is the, the fluorescence from the, from the cone ion after laser cooling. But we are interested basically in this point here at the very beginning, which is our what corresponds to our initial temperature of the ion in the trap, which is measures the average of the I was noticing like down by zero zero. It looks like there's like a jump um, on both sides. Yeah. Yeah. So this is when we. This is basically when the laser is being turned on. Okay. Okay. 
Yeah, so this is just the, the background noise on the on the photo. So if you do this for a hot iron, the, the traces look like this. If you do this with a, for an iron which is already cold, then uh, there's no change of the rest over time. You always see this, the, the saturated value. And uh, with these measurements, so we can now from these measurements at several times when the iron is immersed into the cold gas, and we can monitor uh, basically over the time, same time scale where we saw the, the atom number drop in the previous plot, we now see over the time, same time scale how the temperature um, of the iron drops. And this is basically the direct measurement that, um, that the iron is cooling. You see here these, these error bars, they are quite large, which are basically limited by the, by the, by the photon shot noise in these fluorescence measurements. This is a bit of a downside of this measurement. So this point here is greatly exaggerated. So we can use different um, techniques to, to estimate the temperature down here. Um, and we see that this point indeed has, has two million calories, but uh, whatever, 500 million so, so what was the separation of the levels in the ion traffic? Mm -hmm. Two microcalories. And the depth of the BC is one mm -hmm. micro. One micro yes. So it takes more than one atom, right? To take a whole lot of atoms to yes. escaping. To yes. A single atom cannot do it. No. It can, you see here, we lose around 15,000 atoms in oh, that process. Okay. Oh, I see. Okay. So this is many, many atoms. Yeah. Okay. Um, so this was a very phenomenological approach to, to these collisions and and to, to the effects of the elastic collisions in this process. Now let's uh, look at this a little bit more uh, precisely. So um, you are all exposed to I neutral conditions uh, these days at airports because they're used in explosive detectors. So here's the uh, standard example of um, ion drift measurements. So when they when they swipe your, your backpack on computer with this little knob and they put this in this machine, what's basically happening is that um, well, whatever they pick up is this heated up very quickly, so turn it to vapor, um, being ionized, and then drifts through a drift tube which is filled with some buffer gas. And uh, basically, they measure drift times through these tubes and measure how long certain species take to reach um, the end um, of the drift tube. And this is highly um, specific to the uh, charge to mass ratio of the molecules that you have in your sample. Um, and this is highly robust to um, external parameters. And the reason why this is so robust is that already long ago, in 1905, showed that the, um, the rate constant for the atom ion collisions in a classical picture goes like um, 1 over square root of velocity. So the total reaction rate, which is cross section times velocity, is energy independent. So you don't have to prepare here a certain velocity, or you have to select a certain velocity in order to measure the, the collision rate of the atoms as they go through the gas tube. This all uh, comes out, or all factors out, uh, from the uh, collision cross section uh, in the launch model. And that's why these devices are so, so robust. And uh, these mobility measurements there, they're quite, uh, quite common. However, now if you go to Landau Lifshitz and try to uh, determine the um, collisional cross section um, of the 1 over r to the 4 potential, which you can do, there's an exact solution, which is given here. You see that Landau and Lipschitz show that the cross section should go like 1 over e to the power 1 third. And uh, so the full quantum mechanical calculation of the atom i uh, cross section apparently gives a different energy dependence as compared to the classical. And uh, now we have to understand where this comes from and how in the experiment we can see this or that rate constant for as mine countries. Much of the understanding <coughs> of this difference between the, the longitudinal cross section and the, the, the full quantum mechanical uh, cross section uh, has been done by, by Folk and Bunyan in, in the famous paper in the 1950s. <laughs> and they analyzed basically classical trajectories in the uh, in the one over r to the four potential. So here we have a 
scattering center, which has a one over r to the four uh, potential. And then you shoot particles at it, at it with different impact parameters and see what is going to happen. And what they figured out is that there exists a critical impact parameter we see. If you are smaller than that, then the um, atom, or then the, the, the atoms impinging onto the ion, for example, they go onto orbits where the where the where the particle spirals around the scattering center, and then then goes out into a completely different direction. And uh, they can come very close to each other in this in this scenario. And they lead to a complete randomization of the scattering moment. If you impinge on the ion with an impact parameter larger than this number, so all the blue data, uh, then you basically only get a very slight deflection of your trajectories. But there is really this sharp cutoff for the one over R. And um, so what, what this basically means in, in, so in the quantum mechanical language is we have here reactive scattering. So we have here a situation where the relative distance between the atoms and the ions can become very small, say on the order of the Bohr radius, and then they can, can undergo really reactions, chemical reactions, because the electron clouds really start to overlap uh, with each other. And this is the process, basically, that coincides with what Langevin considered classically for these conditions. The blue ones, the blue trajectories, are just forward scattering. So basically, the, the momentum of the impinging atom is slightly modified, so you get a very small deflection from the scattering center, but you never get any <coughs> backward scattering from the scattering potential. And um, if you sum all of that up, this makes up for the difference between these two expressions. And the full quantum mechanical expression, of course, has all these uh, in it. So the full quantum mechanical expression has this, uh, this weaker uh, decay with energy. OK, so now the question is, what do we see in the experiment? And can we tell one from the other? and uh, we have the sensitive, sensitivity to see that. So I can tell you straight away, seeing that part is easy, because there's something happens, right? There, there are either chemical reactions, or there's a huge momentum transfer between the atoms and the ion. Seeing those, the blue ones, is very hard, because the momentum only marginally changes, and this has never been seen uh, before in an experiment. OK, so before, we, uh, before I show you the data, um, we have uh, let me make a small detour. Namely, we have now to learn how to control the collision energy between the particles. Right? We want to study the energy dependence of the cross section or the energy dependence of the scattering process. And so we have to be able to tune the collision energy. And this comes back out to the past lecture, where I showed you the trajectory of an ion in the track. It's composed of a fast modulation, which is the, what's the micro motion at the drive frequency of the track, and the slow. Uh, oscillation, which was the section. And now, when you think about this, you have a, uh, an ion which is oscillating very rapidly, moving around, and you have a cloud which is essentially at zero temperature, of, say 100 nanocalvins, but very small temperature, sitting around. And now, these, the ion and the atoms undergo a collision. What is going to happen? So the ion is forced on this fast <coughs> oscillation. It hits the atom, it, it momentarily comes to rest, because the, the, the neutral atom has basically the same mass, within a vector of two, same mass. Um, so the continuous phase evolution of this driven motion here is interrupted by the collision. So basically, the ion is set back from its oscillator trajectory to. This leads to, um, the, to, the, to the point that these collisions equilibrate this micro motion into, um, into secular uh, energy. So really into kinetic energy in the trap. And um, this is basically that's shown here. So we, we tune basically the energy of the micro motion on this axis. And this is the kinetic energy measured from the laser fluorescence uh, measurement that I showed here. So with this technique, we can really adjust the uh, kinetic energy of the ion by, um, by equilibrating the micro motion uh, through the collisions into uh, secular energy on this trajectory. And this gives us the, the energy tune that we need in order to study the collisions over a certain range. OK, so now let's look at these elastic collisions where we have extremely little forward scattering. So um, there is no hope, basically, to 
you see this on the eye. The eye is moving at, at, at meters per second um, of, of velocity in there. And a very small shift by the collision with the atom, say changing the, changing the velocity by, by a from wind or something like this, we would not be able to see. However, um, the atoms, they are essentially at zero temperature, they're at rest. So the same amount that the, that the ion's momentum is reduced, the atoms have to take up as momentum. So basically we see how they are promoted from a zero momentum state to a very small but finite momentum state. And this is now the, the advantage of using these ultra cold atmosphere these experiments, because we can really say we start with something which is so close to zero momentum that we can see really minimal changes uh, in the conditions. And uh, so here is a, here's a, for example, the measurement of the increase of the temperature of the atomic cloud um, just due to these collisions. And you see here the temperature changes by maybe 20 nanokelvins or so, uh, depending on the kinetic energy um, of the of the ion. So these are really extremely small, is an extremely small energy the amount of energy which are taken up by the neutral atoms. But since they are so cold, we can actually see these extremely small changes depending on the theoretical collision energy. This also leads to a trap loss. This is a larger error bus, but still you can still see that there's an, there's an increase. There's an, uh, the, the trap loss changes with the kinetic energy um, of, the, of, of the ion. So at higher uh, temperatures, we have, uh, we have more trap loss than at lower energies, which is more or less equivalent. Uh, we can fit this with the semi-classical theory um, of the of the ion conditions. And Langevin theory alone would predict the red line here, so something that's way off scale. Yeah. And so this is the first uh, observation of these forward scattering conditions between the and ions. <coughs> okay, so these were elastic collisions. Now let's turn to, to inelastic collisions or, or, or reactions between the atoms and the ions. Um, and let's start with, with two processes here um, that are. Still relatively, that's still relatively simple to understand, even if you don't know much uh, chemistry. So let's say we start with um, the terbium plus ion, so it's just one valence electron here, and a rubidium atom, which also has one valence electron. So there's always the ionized core, and then one electron on each part. <coughs> now, an elementary reaction that can happen in such a scenario is that one of these electrons goes over to the other. You know all Kuhn's rules. Kuhn's rules favor completely filled electron shells uh, as opposed to half filled or, or, or low filled shells. And um, if the, this one has a noble gas electronic configuration plus one electron. So if I take the electron away, this basically looks like a sharp noble gas. Um, and the terbium that we discussed yesterday has an electronic structure which is similar to an alkaline earth. So this would like to have two electrons in its lowest uh, energy state. So the natural process is that the terbium plus rips off an electron from the rubidium, makes the rubidium single ionized, and uh, makes the, the terbium neutral. This is called a charge exchange. So um, I showed you the, the energy diagrams at the moment, but it turns out that this process is energetically very favorable for our mixture. So it, 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 we gain about two electron volts of energy going from this situation to that situation. However, as we will see, the rate constant of this process is still very slow. Another um, example of, an, of an, uh, reactive collision is the so-called collisional quenching. <coughs> that is the case when you prepare the deuterbium ion in an excited electronic state. So I showed you the D state, I showed you the F state, the, the P state. Um, this collides with the rubidium uh, atom. And then the deuterbium ion is de-excited in that process, and the rubidium is basically unchanged. And the difference of these energies goes basically into kinetic energy. So these are the processes that we're, that we're looking at. So the first question, of course, is how can we actually see that? And um, I'll show you now two movies um, where we can directly see the, the reaction taking place. So here is again the Coulomb crystal, now with two ions, two ion Coulomb crystal in the trap. And, uh, we just overlap the ions with the neutral atoms and wait. Oops. And wait. And then after a while, you see one of these ions that was here is now gone. We only left with one of them. 
However, the position of this one has not changed. So we know that there is still a charge up here because these two charges are each other the form of So the opposite situation would be that. Also here a reaction takes place, but you then see there's only one ion left. But this one has now moved to the center of mass position of the crystal. So this means the other partner has gone and uh, it's lost from the trap. Now the question is, how can we analyze what is this dark particle? Can we, this could be either a terbium uh, rubidium class, as I discussed earlier, could, could be a molecule, could be something else. Um, and the question now is how, how, we, how we can see that. Here again, the four possible outcomes, the react two particles fall before the reaction, either all gone, this happens relatively infrequently, one gone and one dark, one gone or nothing has happened after one. These are the four outcomes. So how do we see that? Well, we can now perform mass spectrometry on the dark particle. And this is a very uh, elegant technique. It was not invented by us. It was invented by uh, Michael Jason and Argus. Um, and basically, if the, the idea is if you have one bright ion in the Coulomb crystal, um, this is enough to find out the characteristic mode frequencies of the Coulomb crystal. And what you're doing now is you're basically shaking the Coulomb crystal, looking for the resonant frequencies where you can excite it. And with this, you determine, for example, the, the stretch mode um, of this crystal. And this tells you about the mass of the unknown particle. And this is basically shown on, on the bottom plot. So you, you, you create a parametric excitation of the, of the, of the, the, the stretch mode of the Coulomb crystal. If you have two ions in here, this provides the normalization that gives you the black lines. So you monitor the fluorescence of these particles. And as you excite the stretch mode, these particles become water. The fluorescence decreases. And, um, and you see the drop of the fluorescence at a specific excitation frequency or here around 40 kilohertz. And this signals the, the stretch mode. Now if you do that on this crystal, of course your signal is weaker because you only have one ion left that you can see, but the physics is the same. And then you see the, the characteristic mode appearing here. If you have a higher frequency, which means that the dark particle is lighter than the, than the particle uh, in, the, in, in, in the two ion crystal. <coughs> you can fit this sort of quantitatively and uh, then find out that this frequency shift here exactly corresponds to the mass of proper plus. And this tells you really what is the dark particle that is left in your trap. This could in principle be extended to, to even more complicated structures. Uh, I mean, we only did it for two usually. Um, but uh, this gives you very high resolution. So if you have enough statistics, you can tell uh, one unit of atomic mass. Okay, so the charge exchange. Um, here are the sketches of the two level diagrams, the, the X1 sigma plus ground state, which is ytterbium plus rubidium plus, and the A3 sigma plus uh, terbium plus plus rubidium. This is our entrance channel. So our particles somewhere they appear, they collide with each other in this potential, usually elastic collision, they just come out, but they can release this almost 2 EV of electron, uh, 2 EV electron, 2 EV of energy to fall down into the charge exchange channel and uh, undergo this reaction. And now, according to, to Langevin, um, these reactive collisions, they should have a rate which is independent of energy. Right? We said before, the cross-section is like one of a square root energy, so the total rate is this times the velocity, which is energy independent. So we measure the uh, charge exchange rate. Um, so from all the data that we collect, we only select those where a dark ion appears, only those where the dark ion is rubidium plus, which is basically always. And uh, then we, we extract the rate as a function of the ion kinetic energy. And you indeed can see here for two different isotopes of the term, this is uh, a rate, an energy independent um, charge exchange collision rate. And so that this is now, with, with these experiments now, this, this, this picture of non and collisions has been sort of basically established all the way down to, to 100 millikessons of energy. Okay, so th this, is, this is nice because we can now really clearly distinguish between the elastic collision resulting from the forward scattering and the reactive collisions re uh, resulting from this, this Langevin process. I said earlier um, that this is of course a lot of energy that can be released, but this process still is very, um, has a very low rate. So roughly, uh, for our combination of terbium plus and rubidium, 
uh, only every fifth collision leads to the shard exchange process. So the system is collisionally uh, quite stable, which is good, so we have enough time to actually see something. Um, we didn't know that before, so we were lucky with this. For example, if you do this with the barium plus endrobridium, basically every uh, collision leads to a, to a charge exchange, which is good because you produce a lot of rubidium ions, uh, but it's bad if you want to study uh, the or the, 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 the other ion. Um, the, uh, the downside of the rubidium plus, of course, is something this cannot be seen. I mean, this, this remains in the track, as we've seen, but this is dark because this is a noble gas electronic configuration. There are no optical transitions where you could do spectroscopy on. And the terbium is gone, right? So after you have released two electron volts of energy, uh, the terbium is gone there. Okay, so this was um, conditions in the ground states. So this state and that state. And um, you asked this earlier, I think. So here are the, the typical uh, energy scales um, that, that, that we have in the problem. So let's start with the electronic excitation in the ion or also in the, in the neutral atom. These are on the order of a few um, electron volts um, above the, the ground state. The trap depth is around 300 uh, milli electron volt in our case. So um, <coughs> if, if, the, if the energy released much bigger than that, then we will lose uh, both partners. And only in a small fraction of the events we will routine. Then the hyperfine interaction, which basically splits the, the ground states here. There's a hyperfine interaction on the turbine plus, and there's a hyperfine interaction on the rubidium. Um, it's on the order of 30 micro EV. So that's uh, much, much smaller than anything. But the lowest here is actually our collision energy, which is on the order of 3 micro EV. So this is even smaller than the hyperfine coupling constant, which means that we, can, we are able to prepare certain hyperfine states and really say, OK, we do a collision in these two hyperfine states with each other, um, and they're not equally spread out over all the other hyperfine states. <coughs> okay, so here are asymptotically our, the, the, the combined energy levels of the rubidium, the germium rubidium uh, entrance channel and for the charge exchange channel. So the charge exchange channel has many, many more um, energy levels in this relevant range, uh, particularly the ground states. I only show you the asymptotic values at large separation between the, um, between the particles um, because only those are known. So uh, we've spoken with a lot of theorists about molecular potentials for the terbium plus and the rubidium, um, and we always got the answer that the terbium is too complicated because it has too many electrons. Uh, most of them behave relativistically as filled F shells and so on. Um, it's very hard apparently to really compute the molecular interaction potentials whereas the asymptotic energies are just the, the atomic uh, energies. So where we don't know really what happens at short distance, uh, so we have to find this out. Um, and now in the next few slides, I will show you how we can now extend this measurement of these, these, these uh, inelastic collisions to these excited states over here. So these states, of course, it's, it's a bit hard. There's always light on if we do that because the light is too short. But D and F states are really long-lived and we can selectively do the chemistry in these states. Okay, so um, we basically do optical pumping, sort of as shown here, into the various states, measure the, the inelastic uh, rate constants, and the important part of parameter here is this epsilon parameter, which is the ratio of inelastic conditions to the modular rate. And I showed, I said you earlier, for the ground state, this is on the order of 10 to minus 5. This is a nice and stable system. So we thought, uh, well, what can go wrong if we go to the other states? Well, we started out with the D state. It's the easiest to populate. And then we found the D power. For every collision between the determining the D state and the rubidium ground state, the charge exchange takes place. So the, all of a sudden, we go from one state to the other. This rate jumps by, by five orders of magnitude. And uh, so this state reacts very, very well um, with rubidium in the Charlie exchange channel. It could be related to the fact that here are two states which are very close um, asymptotically, but uh, it's also not sure that this is the cause because the, the, the physics is really taking place at short distances for the Charlie exchange channel. Then if you go to the F state out here, this is again a smaller number of on the order of a percent, and for the P state, it's on the order of so this is just to show you if we change the, the internal state of the ion, 
we can change these, these, these <coughs> reaction rates by orders of magnitude, um, which can be which can be helpful if you want to study chemistry or accelerating chemistry, for example, that is needed. Um, however, if you want to do cooling, like what I said in the very beginning, having this rate very low is, is, is certainly advantageous. Okay, and then the next step was then to change the Rubidium hyperfine state, as I said, we have, the, we have the energetic resolution to do the experiments in specific hyperfine state. And again, we see then that this changes. Well, in the D state, it, cannot, it did not change much, it remains the same. But in the S state, we see that this rate goes up by around a factor of 30 if we just go to the different hyperfine state. So this is, the, the physics is extremely rich, and that's happening here at short distances. And uh, but, but this is now a very precise and quantitative way um, to explore this. Okay, so here's some more details about the reaction control. So we can populate certain mixtures of, uh, of states, so ground state, uh, sorry, D3 half state, uh, P1 half state, S1 half state, the ground state, the black one, uh, by optical pumping, and then look for the rates, and we can really see that we're, we're completely dominated <coughs> by the state. So this, this was the, the chart exchange. Now, Let's discuss the, the collisional quenching. So the collisional quenching is um, significantly more difficult to observe. So that was the case where the ion goes to an excited state, undergoes the collision, and becomes de-excited back um, to the ground state. So uh, for the collisional quenching to be observed, we first we have to prepare the, the ion in, in one of its metastable state, and then uh, the, 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 the direction process has to take place within the lifetime of the state, which is not guaranteed uh, in the field. So for the D3 half state, we could never see that. And then we went on to go to the F state, because if it doesn't happen in 10 years, uh, it's probably not worth investigating it. So uh, we pumped the population all the way into the F state over here. And uh, we did this again for a two ion crystal. So here's just the fluorescence carols on the S2P transition. So here's the pumping. So we have some background fluorescence of the two ions. Then this drops to zero. Let's focus on the, well, on the, on the, on the, the uh, blue curve first. Then we wait for a few seconds. And then we do this repumping this with, with these many lasers back to the S state. This takes 100 milliseconds. But then after six seconds, we recover that both ions are still there. So not, no ion has been lost. Um, but uh, also there was no quenching. In Right? So they stay dark when they were in the F state, and eventually they just return. And then from time to time, the following sequence was observed. So that you pump also to the F state. Then after some random time in this interval, all of a sudden the fluorescence popped back to half the value. Which means that one of the, the, the ions which were in the F state have fallen back into the S state. They were quenched back by the collisions. And then upon, re, uh, upon repumping, both of them occurred, uh, uh, appeared again. So uh, these are the events that we were interested in because they signal the, the collisional quenching from this state by the collision with the, with the ground state and um, rubidium atoms, where population goes to the non-radiation process straight. And then this could be seen really only with this very, very long lift state, because you see here, this happens uh, only after a few seconds, and the lifetime of this guy is only 15 milliseconds. So this, this was this one we All right. So this is the, uh, what I wanted to show you about the, the inelastic um, collision with star exchange and with collision of quenching. And now, that's, uh, uh, yes? Can one infer a rate for this, uh, for this collision of quenching? Um, I think we have some estimates in the paper, but we have very few events. Maybe we have only, I don't know, 20 or 50 or so events. It's hard to make a rate out of that. Um, but there, I think we have a we have a histogram at least where we can say how likely it is after a certain time. Okay, so now for the for the last part, <coughs> let's go um, a little bit more in depth of the what is going on here because now we really are not only interested in the electronic states of the ions, but we're really interested in, in how the spins behave. So. Uh, each of these ions in, in such a crystal can be thought of as a, as a spin, spin one half or, or, or a spin one, um, depending on the, on the state. 
And um, I showed you yesterday, um, or I mentioned yesterday, that uh, these chains are very popular for quantum information processing, where these spin states are basically the carriers um, of the quantum information. So these are electronic or hyperfine spins in the electron. And we now want to see how these spins interact with this neutral atomic bar uh, surrounding them. Okay, so here is sort of the, the artist's uh, impression, or the PhD student's impression for this one. Um, we have a single spin, which is our ion. Um, we have completely spin polarized gas around it, the, new, the, the red ones are the neutral atoms. And then from time to time, the ion and the <coughs> Um, and the neutral atom, they are there colliding with each other. And uh, what in principle can happen is that this spin can flip or can be rotated or something else can happen. I will come to the different mechanisms um, in a moment. Uh, but a priori it was not clear what um, the mechanism here um, would be, whether it's spin exchange or whether it's spin relaxation that is going in place. And also the question is how fast does this go? So, um, Again, this happens. This happens on time scales which are associated with a lower and lower rate, of course, because these are, are are processes which involve atoms and ions coming together to the next scale of the four radius form. Um, but uh, the rates were, like the other ones, were not known a priori, so we wanted to find that out. And this is actually a relatively nice model system for for what people call the um, the spin bath model, where you have completely spin polarized bath, one spin in there, and Purity spin, which then couples um, to the rest of the bath. Um, so there are, there are these two competing or different models, not competing, they're, they're different for how a spin one half particle can couple to different environments. Uh, historically, earlier, I think it was Caldera and Leggett uh, model where you have a spin one half coupling to <coughs> oscillator modes, which basically motivated from, from the solid where the spin one half couples to proponent modes. Um, but this is also sort of in a in very elementary sense, spin one half coupled to a bath of, of photon loads is also just the model which gives you spontaneous emission uh, from, a, from a two level system. So it is basically uh, the, the situation that this describes. Um, this spin volume problem has a, has a continuous spectrum and has very interesting regimes uh, outside the normal spontaneous emission problem that has been discussed by Bob Cadera. Then the other model is the, the spin one half, uh, the, the, the spin bath problem, which is uh, a different model, namely that is a model where a, one, one purity spin couples to a set of localized spins uh, in the environment. And this is uh, often used for example in semiconductors, probably can also be applied to, to the NB uh, problem, um, where uh, you have a, a set of localized spins coupling to your uh, impurity. And this, there, there is a nice new effect of copy, for example. Um, uh, people have tried to, to use this, for example, in, in uh, semiconductors, uh, quantum dots, where they, they actually pump quantum dots to polarize, for example, their environment to realize this, uh, this spin pattern. Okay, so um, what is the fundamental interaction that we're having here? So um, there are two basic mechanisms for how the two spin two particles can collide with each other. So that the, the simplest <coughs> one, or and also the, the most, uh, the, the clearest one is spin exchange. So spin exchange is a, is a process where the total spin is conserved. So basically this means you have two spins, this one and this one, they're colliding with each other. And uh, what can happen in this process only when you want to conserve the total spin is that they can rotate each other around the sum of the two spin orientations. With this, you preserve all the necessary uh, angular momentum, but the individual spins are not conserved in this process. That's why it's called spin exchange. So this is sort of coordinately depicted here. The white arrow is the sum of the two spin orientations, and the two spins can precess around that. This has also a uh, very important, um, uh, one, one very important uh, uh, thing that is related to this. If you have stretch spin states, so if these two spins are aligned really perfectly in the same direction, there cannot be any spin exchange, right? If this rotates, nothing changes. 
So if you have a so-called spin stretch, a stretch a spin state, um, there will be no change um, of the spin. The other mechanism that you can have is spin relaxation. Spin relaxation basically is you have a spin which is in some medium um, that collides with whatever phonons, whatever in this medium, and then can just relax to the ground state. Um, this process obviously does not conserve any momentum to begin with. So, or spin. Um, so you need some coupling between spin and orbital angular momentum um, to, uh, to, to support this process. Um, this is of course in, in solids, this is very common. Uh, actually, it's in the conductors. Um, to have this mechanism. Um, however, in our system with the, with the, with the atoms alone, um, this process is usually very, very weak. So when you do experiments with neutral atoms, spin relaxation is basically absent. Uh, the elastic collision rate is, is, uh, can be compared to the spin exchange rate, but the spin relaxation rate is, is I don't know, five, six oil weight weaker than that in the neutral atoms. And also, in, in, for example, in, in this object, you pumped helium three gases, it's the same. Okay, so how do we detect that? Um, so basically, what we do, we have two spin qubits in our determinant mine, depending which isotope we're using. So the 174 interview <coughs> has no nuclear spin, so the ground state is just either an electron up, spin up, or an electron spin down. So these just two, these two levels, um, which is a very simple uh, qubit system. However, it's magnetic field sensitive, so it has a small uh, drawback here, but still it can be used. And then we can do a selective readout of uh, any of these. The isotope 171 interbium has a nuclear spin of 1 half, so it has an F equals 0 ground state and an F equals 1 excited state. And between these two MF equals 0 states, you can also have a qubit, which is now magnetic field insensitive because both of these states have zero uh, magnetic moment. They have an energy spinning of 12 gigahertz, and again, we have a selective readout of these two states. So we can work with both of them, and we have the experiment with both of them, um, and then we can see the differences. Uh, in the reaction rates. The rubidium um, has this ground state. We have an F equals 1 and an F equals 2. So remember, F was the hyperfine uh, quantum number, um, which is more complicated than total. These are eight states um, split by around 7 gigahertz. And uh, basically, you can populate any of these states or any mixture of the states, uh, whatever you want. Uh, so we always start from a, from a spin polarized sample in the uh, in, this, in the most upper state, the F equals 2, F equals 2, and then with the radio frequency transitions, you can put your population anywhere where you want. Okay, so how does this, uh, how does this measurement proceed? Let's look at the first row uh, to begin with. So you prepare the ion either in the ground state or in the excited state, and then we prepare the rubidium completely in the ground state. The low state that's available is all in the weak magnetic field, so that the genesis are split. And then um, we monitor the population of the excited state of the turbine mine as a function of time. So, and what, what do we see? When the, the turbine is in the excited state, this is the green data, the population of this excited state decays after a while, goes to roughly 60% on the time scale of maybe two or so longer long times. That's a relatively rapid decay of the spin population, or the spin excitation in this term of mind. So it must just needs two or so long noise collisions before the spin relaxation is complete. Start with the interbium in the ground state. So the interbium in the ground state, the rubidium in the ground state, and you said, okay, what the hell should happen here? Right. They're all in the lowest, lowest energy. And then still monitor the population of the excited state, and then you see that there is on exactly the same time scale there's a buildup uh, of the of the, 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 the spin. So the, the uh, spin starts to mix between these two states and comes up here and ends up at the same equilibrium level. So in the end, the, the spins of the ions are always in a specific mixture, uh, which, which is given here. So roughly 60% in the higher state and 40% in the lower state, no matter where you start. So what, what, what is caused, or what, what causes this um, exactly, we don't know, to be honest. Um, but this is not a stretched spin state. So in principle, we could have relaxing processes here 
So if we have external energy in the problem, so kinetic energy, for example, and we have a coupling between motion and uh, spin degrees of freedom, then uh, this energy, the external energy, can make up for the, the Zeeman energies here. And uh, since this is not a, not a spin polarized state, or a spin stretch state, um, these, these states can mix and be this behavior. But that's why we then went on to do the same experiment, but with rubidium in the stretched spin state. So this is now the state where the electronic spin and the nuclear spin are aligned with each other, maximally. And uh, here, in the third, of course, the, the electron spin is either up or down. So this combination here, in this case and that case, both electronic spins are pointing up. Um, and this should be the spin stretch state, which should be stable uh, if you just have spin exchange collisions in the world. However, what we see, basically, more or less, is the same. So again, on the time scale of few long the collisions, the spin polarization drops, goes to a different uh, saturation value. Um, but uh, nevertheless, even the spin stretch states, they, they decay. And this is the clear signature that uh, we don't have a, a spin exchange process here at work, because the, this process is not due to this behavior, but it must be really spin relaxation um, caused by coupling to other orbital uh, elements. Okay, so now we can, uh, okay, for different combinations, we can find out what the, what the steady state is. Okay, I'll skip over that. And, um, then we were, of course, interested in what happens now to the magnetic field in sensitive fuel. Because, firstly, it has a much, much bigger energy gap. So, before we had a few megahertz between these levels here, or in, in the Jerry Reserve, and now we have three orders of magnitude more, around 10 gigahertz. And there, indeed, what we see is that the excited state, for example, here relaxes really quickly to the ground state, that's the blue curve. But um, there's not enough energy in the system for the ground state to populate any excited state. So the 10 gigahertz is a large enough uh, energy static for this state to be, to be protected. You see, this stays always um, basically in the ground state. This stays in the ground state, provided that we start with rubidium also at the lowest state. So I said, this is 7 gigahertz, this is 10 gigahertz. Now, if we put the rubidium in the excited state, then again, this situation changes too. We get again the relaxation of the excited state, but now we also can get a build-up of the excited states in population from the ground state. And this is basically because we release this energy, which can to some degree make up for the missing energy here. Not very much, this goes only up to roughly 20% um, or so. But again, this happens on a time scale of <coughs> So the, the spinning the, the spin relaxation processes are really strong here in this in this uh, measurement and the the, the longitudinal coherence time of the spin corresponding to is relatively short. And sort of just one, sort of just to remind you, to remind you, this is all measured with one spin. Not in ensembles or anything. These are thousands of repetitions uh, all the time with one spin. So from this we can basically, well, from the if you if you assume that you have a, a sort of a Boltzmann distribution here, then this would correspond to a spin temperature of 200 millikelvins between these levels. And this is roughly also our kinetic temperature in the system. So uh, yeah, our kinetic temperature is on the order of 240 millikelvins. So we think that we have a relatively good equilibration between the, the, the uh, orbital degrees of freedom from the motion and the spin degrees of freedom. OK, so now we can go into more detail. Now we can actually go further and look at how the um, spins relax within the specific manifolds. For example, the question is when you start with, with a state in the, the spin in this beta state, does it decay straight down here, or does it first go out to any of the neighboring states and then decay? Yes. So, uh, just, uh, so can you can you make several measurements of the same VC? Like, as in, you could prepare the VC once and then repeat the spin. Yes, so you know, we did around ten measurements on the same VC. So um, this, but sort of this, as a result, sort of the measurements were done at different densities. But uh, since we expressed everything in the Langevin rate, this sort of then recalibrated with the density for the specific measurement. Yes. yes. Otherwise, the measurement time is the same. Thing. Okay. So um, we now with the with the with the, with the all the uh, optical interrogation techniques that we have with the with the iron 
we can indeed see the population of all these spin states um, individually uh, and time resolved. And basically what we, what we do is we prepare the eye in this spin state right here and then monitor the neighboring states as a function of time as well as the decay of the beta state. And the beta state decays um, as expected, again on the same time scale as before, but at the same time we also see that the population in these states temporarily builds up before it falls down again. That's shocking. So we really see the, the, the microscopic picture really is that this spin state gets mixed both down here as well as in these states which then subsequently decay into the uh, spin ground state. And again, what causes this really in detail, uh, we don't know yet. What, what couplings are really at work here. Uh, to, to elucidate this, you really would have to know the internal structure of the molecular potential spectrum than we do. Okay, so here is a sort of the best guess of the molecular potentials. Um, but, uh, okay, let me skip this. <laughs> so, then finally, um, the, the last thing that we were interested in, so okay, we see that the excited state decays, uh, the excited spin state decays in the interaction with the, with the, with the bath, with the environment. Um, the, the final question that we want to answer is then, uh, what happens to suppositions of spin states? So when we prepare, say, a superposition which is 50% up plus 50% down, um, how quickly does this decohere? Of course, it, it cannot live longer than the, than the, than the Z polarization. I mean, eventually, uh, this governs everything. But the question is, can we maintain the um, this in the coherence at least for that long? And uh, for this, we make uh, Ramsey interferometry um, on this uh, on this transition here. So uh, on this magnetic field insensitive qubit, because this is now uh, a very very um, uh, delicate measurement. You have to preserve the, the spin coherence uh, for 400. So we better work with the magnetic field insensitivity. So we prepare the measurement, wait for it, so apply a fiber two pulse, wait for a time, apply another fiber two pulse, complete the Ramsey sequence, and just measure the, the Ramsey contrast as a function of time. And uh, these are basically the data here. You see how initially we have a Ramsey contrast here of maybe 60% or so, and this then diminishes um, over time. And you see here, these are tiny frequency offsets. So we talk about 10 hertz, uh, frequency of 100 milliseconds, and it's a typical duration. And we see how the visibility decays from around 60%, then again, on time scale of, of, a, of a larger long collision. And it's about the same time scale that, that where we see the, the T1 um, time as well. We were also hoping in the beginning to actually see frequency shifts of this transition, of, of these Ramsey fringes. Because these frequency shifts, they could consider coherent interactions between the atoms and the and the ion um, on this transition. But within our resolution of maybe half hertz of the determination of the the Ramsey period here, uh, we could not see these shifts. They're, 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 they're too small. Right. So um, that's basically uh, the, the the bottom line here. So we can investigate really the the. Um, the spin physics also in this hybrid system, where we have the single ion immersed into this, this bath of, 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 uh, of neutral atoms, which constitutes a, a spin bath. Um, and we, we could measure the coherence times of the spins, as well as the, 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 the relaxation times of the spins. Um, and for this combination of atoms of ion, it's relatively short. So, as I said, a few large amount of times um, is where the, where the spin decoheres. Whereas the other chemical reactions like charge exchange or so on, they are, they are much slower. So they, with respect to charge exchange, this is for 10 to the 5 larger resolution. So this doesn't at all show up on this scale here. Okay, this brings me basically to the end um, of, this, of this talk. So I've showed you basically what we can do in this, in this hybrid system of, of trapped ions and, and trapped neutral atoms, how we can explore new regimes uh, of chemistry. Um, and uh, really making use of the extraordinary control that we have over the individual systems. So for example, the Ramsey uh, method at the end, um, this is really, uh, this was really sort of the, the, the important bit that we know that we can do this with individual systems like the ion, they're so well controlled that we have long enough uh, Ramsey periods 
that we could actually see how uh, collisions or interactions with, with the environment shift these RAM periods, uh, RAM uh, contrast. Um, and also the, the exploration of the, the chemical uh, reactions at, at these low temperatures. Um, this, is, this takes us also to a regime of chemistry which has not been explored before. And so, yeah, so in, in total, I think uh, we have a lot of benefit here from the, from the hybrid approach uh, between these two different approaches. Thanks. Signal, right? Yes. Uh, can you have multiple frequencies or does that come up right now? No, 
No, you can catch several. Yes. Okay. So in principle, you can you can detect some of these dark states using <coughs> multiple frequencies. Ah, yes. Okay. So we're using that transition which generates the highest signal. Right. So the the, the other um, dark states they have uh, much less scattering rates. Right. So. The, the scattering rate is directly related to the, to the lifetime of the state. Right. So long-lived states generate very little photons. Okay. So, um, so we cannot see them directly. We always have to pump them back into the main S to P transition okay. in order to get a signal out. Can you try to use a multi-photon sequence to, to find those dark states? I mean, in principle. Yes, and it's maybe not. Yeah, in a way, that's what we're doing. I mean, for the, for the quenching experiment, uh, this is exactly what we did. Mm -hmm. We did the experiments in the F state and then brought everything back for detection to, to the state where we can see it. Yeah, they, 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 these, these things are possible. Okay. So, if you join me, thank you.